Good day, everyone, and welcome to the 19th episode of Encyclopedia Hermetica, A Big History. So my goal today is to do a bit of review and go back over some of the, the people, uh, the events, and the themes that we've discussed in earlier lectures. And then I'm going to try to wrap it all up in one big broad picture, um, focusing on the themes of slavery and social inequality. We talked in some detail about the Bronze Age, its collapse, and the subsequent Iron Age, and this is where I want to focus my attention today um, on some of the sub-phases of the Iron Age chiefly what we call the Archaic Period and the Classical Period. I should mention that these are rather loose designations, which often bleed into one another uh, chronologically, and the dates of one civilization's, quote, Archaic or Classical periods don't necessarily match up with those of other civilizations. These sorts of dating schemes, like most things, are all relative. When we speak about the classical period of China, the dates aren't necessarily the same as those of classical Greece or classical Rome. Um, not only that, but the term classical itself is somewhat useless as a designation. It doesn't really denote anything specific, but refers to a two-dimensional snapshot of what we deem to be that civilization's golden age of, of law and literature and science and so forth. It's about what we deem to be the archetypal period of that people's success, and largely it's a judgment based on our own values and not those of the societies in question. So if we had to make the generalization, the Archaic classical periods are from around the years 1000 BC to roughly 1 AD. And these numbers are really entirely up for debate if, if people want to do that. But I'm just giving a, a provisional model to get a few points across. Um, remember that up to this point in our discussion, we haven't even gone past the year 400 BC. So some of my generalizations might go beyond our current scope, but we'll, we'll get there eventually. Now, just to get some of my sources out of the way. For today's talk, I compiled some work by Robert Garland, Peter Stearns, David Christian, and Garrett Fagan, who are all great history professors in their own right. All right, so many of the so-called classical civilizations were focused chiefly in areas where the great river valley civilizations had flourished earlier, though not always necessarily directly atop the ruins of these old cities. Um, expansions and relocations of populations were quite common following the destruction of cities. Chinese civilization spread from along the northern portion of the Yellow River down southward, forming the Middle Kingdom, which would persist as a relatively coherent core throughout Chinese history from then onward. In India, the Vedic Indo-Aryan civilization would spread from the Indus River Valley through the whole of the subcontinent, uh, subduing local Dravidian populations as they expanded the reach of their quote-unquote classical Indian culture. Some time later, classical Mediterranean civilization centered in Greece, Italy, and the Levant would ultimately inherit much of Egypt and Mesopotamia's glory. Um, we could probably add Persia to this group, though they were ultimately more of an independent Central Asian phenomenon, descended from the Babylonians and the Assyrians, than a direct outgrowth of those civilizations in the Mediterranean who took part in the Bronze Age collapse. 
Now, it's important to note that this so-called classical world of Chinese, Indian, Persian, and Mediterranean civilizations didn't make up the whole of the world. Obviously, these giant technologically advanced and warlike societies would radiate influence into peripheral societies and, of course, receive influence in return. Uh, we see this dynamic at work between the Persians and the Scythians, the Greeks and the Thracians, the Chinese and the inhabitants of Korea and Vietnam, uh, the Romans and North Africa and Northern Europe, and so forth. But the inhabitants of the world's classical civilizations weren't the only people on the planet, not by any stretch of the imagination. Beyond the borders of most large agrarian civilizations were either clusters of independent farming communities left over from the Bronze Age, or even remote scattered pockets of Neolithic type peoples and nomadic pastoralist type peoples, which were always being destroyed or subsumed into larger civilizations as the year went by. During the time of the Roman Empire, for example, uh, much of Northern Europe was still broken up and organized into tribal societies with varying levels of technological development. Uh, Herodotus's ethnographies and Tacitus's Agricola would become quite famous as works elaborating this concept of the noble savage. This is a concept that it existed long before Columbus made contact with the Americas. At the same time, the classical civilizations were remarkably larger than the previous river valley civilizations of the Bronze Age, and this was thanks to advances in agriculture, in infrastructure, in medicine, and so forth. So we should really stress that although these civilizations didn't comprise the whole world, they certainly took the prize for the highest levels of population density and thus complexity. At its height, classical China was comprised of approximately 54 million people, and the Roman Empire could boast about the same number at 52 million people. In many world history courses you might find at your local university, a common practice is to study comparatively two contemporary powers, the Roman Empire and China during the period of the Han Dynasty, since they were roughly equal in power, albeit on opposite sides of the Eurasian continent. I won't be doing this, however, uh, since to me, Chinese history is an ominous black vortex sucking in all light that I cast on it, uh, so I will not presume to teach it beyond a few points here and there where I can connect it to material that I'm more familiar with. To speak of a Roman Empire at this point also is jumping the gun a bit, uh, since we haven't even passed the Peloponnesian War in Greece, but we'll get there, and so I'll have a few points which touch on Rome. Ultimately, one of the things we need to do to give this concept of classical civilization some significance without reducing it to a hodgepodge of random factors is to make sure we emphasize an appropriate number of similarities and differences. China, compared to India, was a remarkably secular culture. Uh, Classical China gave birth to the Confucian ideology roughly around the same time as the Buddha, the Zoroaster, Lao Tzu, Pythagoras, and the Hebrew prophets each espoused their own personal philosophies and conceptions of justice. But Confucianism would be the single most important ideology in Chinese society in spite of Taoism and Buddhism, arguably even today, with its focus on the importance of socio-political cohesion and family values rather than soteriological elements. Confucian thought focused chiefly on the cultivation of compassion and virtue and the maintenance of one's humanity through ethics. As a belief system, it's relatively secular, 
Uh, but it doesn't deny the existence of gods. It doesn't deny the need for rituals. Uh, it doesn't deny the concept of natural law or even some of the more shamanic and mystical type experiences more routinely attributed to practitioners of, say, Taoism or Buddhism. In its early periods, however, uh, Confucianism never really left China, just as Hinduism never left India. And, of course, this fact is opposed by the missionary successes of Buddhism, which began in Nepal and spread to every corner of the Asian continent, perhaps fulfilling a need in people, especially in rural regions, which Confucianism or Hinduism could not fulfill. This lack of Confucianism's spread might also have something to do with its distaste for merchants on account of their involvement with money. Um, like I said in an earlier lecture, the history of philosophy and its relationship to money has always been fraught with some trouble. Merchants, or people who use trade routes at the very least, were the primary disseminators of information before the printing press grew into popular use, and so giving them a raised eyebrow may have had something to do with Confucianism's relative isolationism. Though I suppose Buddhism and early Christianity also had tenuous relationships to money and money making, and they had no problem spreading about, so this may be a moot point. Anyways, moving on. In terms of science and technology, uh, classical China's achievements outshone those of its Western contemporaries, though it wouldn't be fair to say that they weren't far behind in parallel development. At the height of the Han Dynasty, about 1% of China's population was enlisted in government bureaucracy. This might seem small by our standards, but for this period, this level of organization was really unheard of elsewhere. I would argue that the style of governance out in the West was far looser, um, far more informal, and more organic than rigidly bureaucratic. And this would account for the slight lag in technological advancement when we compare the Western civilizations to the Eastern classical civilizations. Uh, China was just far more centralized and educated thanks to their expansive bureaucratic systems. And this is probably what gave them their technological edge over the West in the long run. If we ask why this might be, well, it could have something to do with geography. Uh, China was prone to some invasion from the steppes to the north and the west, uh, but not all that often until a later period. This may have given them an impetus to work toward social cohesion and protect one another from foreign invaders, but without attacks being so frequent that they'd cause mass social disruptions and tear the system of social cohesion asunder. One broad generalization we can make about Greek science, uh, as opposed to Chinese or Indian science at this juncture, was that it was far more theoretical in nature than practical. Great minds in natural philosophy, in physics and mathematics were not being funded as eagerly by local governments, and this led Greek philosophy down a path of great metaphysical contemplation instead of great feats of science and engineering. Though, of course, the Greeks had these too. So, uh, for example, it's during this period that Thales of Miletus, who we've mentioned before, is the first attested Occidental to predict a solar eclipse, in addition to being the man who knew that a magnet attracts iron and that amber, when rubbed, becomes magnetic. Uh, he also knew what today we call the Thales proposition, which is that triangles that run along the diameter of a circle are right-angled. In any case, it's this kind of speculative stuff, rather than the more practical elements of Indian or Chinese science, which led to the development of today what we call Indian numerals, or sometimes erroneously Arabic numerals, uh, which wouldn't come to knock out the clumsy Roman numeral system until the Middle Ages. 
Nevertheless, I don't want to belabor this point too much. Uh, Greece had all sorts of great practical scientific discoveries too. Uh, Theodorus of Samos was credited with the invention of smelting ore and casting. Um, he invented the water level, the lock and the key, the carpenter's square, and the turning lathe. Um, Greece also has folks like Alcmaeon of Cretona. Uh, he was a Greek anatomist living in Italy who discovered the difference between veins and arteries near the end of the 6th century. Between about the years 600 and 500 BC, uh, advancements in irrigation and water management continued to make headway around the globe, leading to greater and greater populations and thus greater and greater population pressures. Um, the sundial or the gnomon is used around the same time in both Greece and China. Uh, as per the orders of Pharaoh Nico in Egypt, Phoenician sailors circumnavigate the whole of Africa over the course of three years, having gone clockwise starting in the Red Sea. Titus Priscius builds the first of many Roman stone bridges to come. Uh, and most classical societies at this point are operating on a 10-month lunar calendar, which, if you ask me, makes a lot more sense than the system we've got in place now, but I'm no astronomer. Uh, the Babylonians, however, uh, began around this time to use a 354-day lunar year with 12 months alternating between 29 and 30 days. So we've looked at a few of the really countless differences between all the major quote-unquote classical civilizations. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you what the three major parallels were. The first of these parallels, um, and I'm doing this one first to please the materialists, uh, was that these civilizations were economically integrated. They each formed a self-sustaining system of exchange on their own. Uh, China had deliberately dug out canals linking the wheat-producing regions of the north with the rice-producing regions to the south to facilitate the exchange of goods somewhat locally. Mediterranean rulers eagerly sought out regions from which they could buy grain, such as in North Africa, uh, and then they traded it by sea. The Mediterranean basin was an entirely self-sustaining system made up of numerous cultures which ultimately had a similar diet, similar religions, similar wants for luxury goods like wine and oil, and so forth. Um, we even call India today uh, a subcontinent all on its own, being mostly cut off in the north by the Himalayas and in every other direction by the Indian Ocean, Th this sort of geography caused India to become a system of its own, um, albeit not an entirely closed one. And this was all purely on account of the principle of least effort. The second parallel is culture. All of these societies created key cultural systems or programs, if you will. These include things like Confucianism and Taoism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, Greek philosophy, and so forth, uh, all of which experienced significant growth in the 6th and 5th centuries. So we've got religions and philosophies, but we also have aesthetics or artistic traditions which bound these systems together. Uh, sure, Egyptian and Greek art are somewhat different, uh, but when you compare them to, let's say, Chinese or Indian art, you'll discover far more parallels than what first met the eye. Finally, the third parallel between all these major civilizations was political integration. And by that, I really mean social stratification by threat of violence. The elites are really the folks who made these first two parallels I just mentioned possible um, by virtue of their surplus wealth and their extra leisure time. That surplus wealth could be allocated to public building projects, trade endeavors, uh, religious undertakings, and so forth. Intrinsic 
to the concept of classical civilization, of, of city-based existence, is a strong specialization of labor and thus a strong division of classes. China developed a consistent imperial tradition. Persia did too. India had two prominent imperial periods. Uh, Athens would give it a try. Alexander would give it a try. Rome would eventually get around to it after conquering Carthage and getting real rich. Um, Tacitus himself, a Roman elite, would of course have very positive things to say about this whole business of civilization. And I quote, they rape, slaughter, plunder, then call it empire. They make a desert and call it peace. Now, the results of all these rapes, slaughters, and plunderings constituted the achievements which all later cultures would look back upon with a great degree of reverence. Uh, I guess some might say that you can't make an omelette without cracking a few eggs, uh, but they'd probably be of the edgier persuasion or possibly flat-out psychopaths. That aside, it's worth noting that each of these societies created a number of value systems which would long outlive these societies themselves. And I think that it's this fact that lies at the core of our concept, classical. One question we might ask in looking at all of this is, why did all agrarian civilizations wind up so similar despite being relatively isolated from one another? It's important, I think, to appreciate how many and how odd the similarities are from one ancient culture to another. Why didn't each culture develop in their own completely unique ways? Well, collective learning ensured that as the generations passed by, humans could collect more and more resources and thus allowing populations to rise. This led to denser and thus more complex communities. Uh, remember, complexity is quantifiable. It's based on the number of connections within a given system. Uh, more brains means more complex, period. So now what happens is that as communities grew denser and more complex, the probability that individuals around the world would run into the same kinds of problems got higher and higher. And so too did the probability that individuals around the world would come to quite similar solutions. Self-defense, waste disposal, food management and distribution, these sorts of factors were all bound to emerge as problems once a society reached a certain level of density. So this is probably what accounts for the parallel development of isolated cultures. It's, it's not necessarily that there is some teleological attractor drawing everybody along the same path of evolution. So I want to take the rest of the time in this lecture to talk about one very important topic, and that's slavery and social inequality. I think that it goes without saying that all classical civilizations were deeply marked by inequality. We've charted the rise of social stratification earlier on in my lectures, uh, following the rise of things like agriculture, uh, writing, and patriarchy, which are all inextricably intertwined. But I think now that I'm doing a review session, I ought to talk about the ancient world's problem of social inequality in a little more detail. Every known society in the ancient world practiced some form of slavery or another. The earliest records that we have of a distinction being made between slaves and freeborn folks uh, are in the Sumerian Code of Urnamu, written around 2100 BC and uh, 2050 BC. The Babylonian Code of Hammurabi, dating to around 1700 BC, also makes this distinction between freeborn, freedmen, and slaves. I think it goes without saying that there was no concept of something like a human right back then, uh, 
before Christianity and the idea that we are all equal in the eyes of the Creator, uh, the very idea of equality or inequality never even came into people's minds. Jesus, Confucius, Buddha, uh, none of these great Axial Age teachers ever even really talked about slavery. They were just a given. Uh, they tended to be of the persuasion that if you were a master, be a good and honorable master, and if you were a slave, be a good and honorable slave. Hierarchy, in everyone's minds whose thoughts have come down to us in writing, was essential. And the old big man view of history runs in tandem with this model. Now, in academia today, there's a somewhat archaic debate afoot between the older historians, who are largely on their way out of academia, and this world for that matter, uh, and those historians who are roughly from the baby boomer generation, and so lived through a real trend in academia that's largely fallen out of popularity with the collapse of the Soviet Union, but was still very extremely useful in tackling numerous problems in various disciplines, and I'm talking about Marxism, of course. The debate on how we ought to look at inequality in history is often fought out between the old guard of so-called great man historians, who tend to emphasize the importance of great men and the triumph of the individual will. Uh, this, we might say, is a very Nietzschean perspective of history, albeit a perspective which Nietzsche himself borrowed directly from antiquity. Um, and then in the other camp, we have the Marxists, the social historians, the people who want to learn about the lives of everyday folks. Peasants, farmers, slaves, merchants, etc. These historians and social scientists aren't as interested in knowing who led 10,000 soldiers off to die in war. They're interested in knowing about the lives of these 10,000 soldiers and what kind of things these people could accomplish together, regardless of whose name wound up attached to their collective success. The old school great man-oriented historians, who I should add are generally quite critical of things like big history or world history, tend to argue along these lines. Sure, the ancient world was marked by inequality. A minority of wealthy landowners acquired a great deal of power and then maintained it by trotting upon the majority of people. This sort of thing happened between men and women as well, but that's just the reality of things and we needn't dwell on this too much because trivial people suffer trivially. And wars, emperors, and great discoveries are really what drives social change, and so we should spend our time talking about these people. If Brad Bartlett were here, uh, he'd say that this is a straw man argument and that it's really a question of the source of social change, top down or bottom up. Marxist historians may be more attuned to the social circumstances that led to an individual like Caesar, but sometimes fail to appreciate the impact that an individual like Caesar can make. Now, from a purely logical point of view, nobody can refute this perspective. It's just one of many perspectives. But this type of thinking really didn't jive with folks espousing the Marxist perspective. The ancients themselves, uh, people like Aristotle, wrote about how slavery was essential to the fabric of society, because only through this particularly brutal institution could the upper class be supported in the act of leisurely contemplation, which is a requisite component of wise rulership. Remember, the word for school comes from the Greek word for leisure. You can't sit around discussing theories of social justice, uh, theories of political philosophy or history, if you're toiling in the fields or in the mines or at the loom or even in the kitchen. For Aristotle, as he describes in the politics, there were two kinds of slaves. There were natural born slaves and I would imagine this means people who look something like me, um, a larger than average build and a capacity for hard labor. And then freeborn slaves were people who were reduced to slavery by war or debt. It had nothing to do with the build of their body. 
It was about their circumstances. So we have a similar view of how people saw the world in the word aristocracy, which means the rule of the best or the most noble. Nobility or excellence was a very important concept, which we find espoused in such Indo-European words as Aryan or its modern reflex, Iran. There was a conception in the ancient world that the aristocracy held the power they held by virtue of their innate excellence. They weren't natural-born slaves. They were natural-born rulers. It was in their very blood. Um, I think it's safe to say that people ascribed far more to the idea that humans were the product of their nature or inborn characteristics than how they were nurtured or culturally programmed. It would take over 2,000 years to see the pendulum swing back the other way, thanks to works of 20th century psychologists. Now, in reality, blood played a very important role in the concept of aristocracy, but not necessarily. It was really a mixture of factors such as lineage, power, lifestyle, wealth, and last but not least, ruthlessness. Uh, these were the factors which ultimately determined an individual or a family's status. Hinduism rationalized social inequality quite easily. Uh, different people are in different social strata on account of their karma, the sum total of their actions in all their past lives. If you do your best within the stratum you were born into, then perhaps you would return on the great wheel of samsara to a more noble and honorable place, or even potentially a higher metaphysical plane altogether. Social advancement is equated with spiritual advancement here. Now what I want to make clear is that religious systems like these were not created to justify social inequality, as many militant atheists these days would have you believe. but. They sure as hell did an excellent job at getting people to accept their place in society. The job of religion, from the Latin redigare, is to create social cohesion. It is designed to quote unquote bind people together, not to keep them separated, uh, but this wound up being the case in either way. Religions weren't designed to justify social inequality, but they often did nevertheless. Now, on paper, the idea of India's caste system seems extremely inflexible. You're born into a specific caste. This determines what kind of jobs you'll be eligible for, what kind of friends you can have, whom you can marry, uh, these sorts of things. It was a complex web of social regulations. Now, despite this concept, there was still a degree of variability of wealth within these castes, and it was not as cut and dry as we might assume. You could be a wealthy Brahmin or priest, or you could be a poor one. This sort of thing didn't change according to your wealth. It's like this idea I've heard people say, uh, quote, you can take the people out of the ghetto, but you can't take the ghetto out of the people. A low-class person with lots of wealth is still considered a base individual, and people don't expect much of you. Whereas a noble fallen on hard times is like a diamond in the rough. They're expected to remain untarnished and uphold their excellence despite their fall from grace. On top of this, uh, we had subclasses within classes, these are called jati, and these had far more flexibility for social mobility than the larger caste brackets. I just want to make sure that I'm clear on this specific point before moving on. Um, although social mobility was a factor in these ancient civilizations, it was definitely not the rule. If we want to think of America as being socially mobile, which it really isn't these days, uh, well, the ancient world was substantially less friendly toward the lower classes in terms of social mobility, even less friendly than today. 
So don't get me wrong. I'm not looking to see the ancient world through rose-colored lenses. There was really no concept of equality in the eyes of God or uh, any such modern rhetoric. Freedom is not a universal value. One more point I want to stress before moving on from this is the idea that lots of disparate social groups, although they shared geographical regions, didn't come into contact with one another all that frequently. Classes stayed relatively isolated from one another, as they do today, living in reclusive and gentrified regions. Um, and although this played a part in cementing the social strata, it also meant people didn't have their inferiority regularly rubbed in their face. Peasants were subject to extortion by landlords, but on a day-to-day -day basis, the landlords weren't really around. They were off being excellent, uh, hunting, doing politics, exercising at the gymnasium, visiting patrons and clients, and so forth. This is partially the reason why invasions of foreign warrior aristocracies all throughout the world uh, rarely change things for the people on the ground level. They usually knocked out the local aristocrats and then assumed their role as tax farmers, leaving things more or less the same for the peasants in their day-to-day -day affairs. Indeed, a foreign invader, depending on the context, could threaten an entire civilization with extinction, or it could pose opportunities for social mobility within the destruction of the old aristocracy. Uh, as long as the new masters weren't jacking taxes to oppressive levels or looting and raping the countryside, people really didn't care who ruled over them because they generally weren't around. This dynamic played a large part in the smooth functioning of a system with such stark inequalities. I think today uh, the wealthy are playing with fire when it comes to their conspicuous consumption coupled with the lack of privacy as brought about by the internet, um, people with a lot less opportunities for social mobility are having the facts of artificial scarcity and social inequality shoved in their faces on a daily basis. And we all know what happened at the end of the 18th century when this sort of popular irritation reached a boiling point. When large parts of a population are starving in the streets because of drought or famine, and your garage has 20 Lamborghinis in it, things are likely to end poorly for you, even if your death will solve nothing. In terms of social stratification, Mediterranean society was particularly noteworthy for its dependence on outright slavery. <clears throat> of course, slavery existed in India and China also, uh, as it continues to exist everywhere in the world today, uh, albeit in a far more limited and marginal manner. Only the Persian Achaemenid Empire, in remarkable contrast, starting with Cyrus until the empire's destruction by Alexander the Great, formally banned slavery. This dependency on slavery not only caused untold amounts of human suffering, but it actually ended up holding the West back vis-a-vis -vis technological developments relative to the Chinese, the Persian, and the Indian classical civilizations. Where the Chinese or the Indians would have generally sought to apply some sort of technological innovation to solve a problem in production, the West had a tendency to just throw more and more slaves at the problem until it went away. This, however, holds more true of the Hellenistic kingdoms and the Roman Empire than it did earlier Greek states, uh, where slavery was far more limited in scope since there were fewer owners of large plantations and more small personal farms. The Mediterranean civilizations paved the way in terms of civil engineering, but insofar as its production technologies were concerned, uh, they were relatively miserable at it. 
I'd argue that on account of the mass levels of artificial scarcity most people are dealing with today in relation to the unprecedented level of technological growth we're experiencing, we haven't learned much. We still tend to just throw human suffering at problems where well-funded feats of engineering could do a much better job, albeit at a higher financial cost. Nevertheless, it's not like anybody thought slavery was a just institution. Uh, they just thought it as a necessary one, because you can't expect to build an empire on the backs of slaves and then expect that empire will stay propped up once you've abolished the institution. Neither freedom nor slavery were immutable and fixed states of being. Uh, a great number of slaves could gain or regain their freedom, and a great number of free men and women could be reduced to slavery just as easily. A slave was at the beck and call of his or her master at any moment's notice, and they could be used and abused in whatever way the master saw fit, regardless of whether this sort of use or abuse ended in death. In both Greek and Roman societies, the testimony of a slave was not admissible in the court of law unless it had been extracted through torture. The slave systems in Greece and Rome and the Near East were really extensive and seem to have intensified over time, culminating in things like latifundia, or great slave plantations in the Roman world, and a number of social upheavals. These upheavals would arguably be the first of their kind. Now, we've been taught by modern historians not to draw too many parallels between the slavery of, say, ancient Rome and that of the transatlantic slave trade. Slavery in the Mediterranean uh, generally involved harsh working conditions, but not necessarily. Getting sent to work in a silver mine was essentially a death sentence, but most slaves were war prisoners involved in domestic service, tutoring, storekeeping, and uh, even paralegal type work. We can't really know for sure how many slaves there were in either Greece or Rome, but we can assume that in the Greek world it made up about 30% of the population, and then dwindled considerably after the Romans conquered the Greek world, since the Greeks themselves were enslaved. According to Suetonius, uh, almost all the slaves in Augustus's house were Greeks. The first great influx of slaves into Rome didn't even really occur until 168 BC after the defeat of the Macedonians, and then in 146 BC after the sack of Carthage. Slavery wasn't one universal, all-encompassing condition. As a status, it varied considerably based on one's qualifications, how much one could be trusted, and the general humanitas of one's owner. There was no question as to whether these folks were owned, um, and from my point of view, no matter how you spin it, this is an egregious offense to mankind, but it was not unheard of for certain slaves of wealthier persons to live fairly luxurious lives, eventually leading to their manumission and employment into a rather cushy position. The chamber slaves of an emperor probably lived better lives than most middle-class working, traveling, soldiering types. There were actually some poorer people who wanted to become slaves, because although you'd lose your legal freedoms, you might stand to gain in terms of material support. Remember, Hardship and disease were rampant, and death was a ubiquitous part of life. A poor parent of a child he or she could not afford might sell this child into slavery to a wealthier family as a way to ensure a more comfortable life for all parties involved. If this child was really bright, he or she might become a member of the imperial bureaucracy or a confidant of a very powerful individual, 
and this overall might lead to a much happier life than he or she would have had as a free citizen. There was some degree of security involved in being someone's chattel, especially given that you would have been a fairly expensive purchase. Uh, and this, of course, sparks a debate as to what is preferable, a comfortable life in captivity or a hard life in freedom. This is not the place for that debate. Uh, but that being said, it was not unheard of for a master and a slave to develop deep ties and mutual respect for one another, as was the case with the great Roman rhetorician Cicero and his secretary Tyro. Tyro is famous for having created the so-called Tyronian shorthand, uh, so he could take down Cicero's notes at the speed at which he spoke, and then uh, he also published all of Cicero's works after Cicero had been decapitated for not knowing when to hold his tongue. All this being said, you'll never hear me argue that slavery was in any way, shape, or form a benign institution. Augustus had a uh, slave's legs broken because he annoyed him, and Hadrian, uh, another one of these allegedly good emperors, stabbed one of his slaves in the eye during a bout of rage. And these are stories about domestic slaves who were treated the best of all. Now, there were in some societies incentives for good behavior. Uh, Roman slaves often received a dole, which amounted up to about 15% of what they actually produced, and on average, it would take most slaves about seven years to buy back their freedom. I should mention that, as far as we know from the record, there was no concept of manumission in Greece. Now, a little bit of historiography here. The reason we actually know any information like this about social inequality in the ancient world is largely thanks to Marxist social historians, the ones I was talking about earlier, the people who decided that battles, inventions, and great generals were all fine and good topics of discussion, but largely missed the point of history, which was to account for how most people lived in their day-to-day -day lives. Now, before moving on, I just want to give quickly my own thoughts on Marxism, and uh, they're more and less in line with my thoughts on most things. Marxism is a model. It is a lens for seeing the world, if you will. It's like any other model. It can be useful if you use it when it's appropriate. It's a tool. There are all sorts of great things we can learn from applying a Marxist model to a number of problems, but there are also a lot of things that Marxism can't explain, uh, notably things which happen on the ideological stage, and for that we'd need to apply a different model. Think of Marxism as a specific computer software you run on the operating system that is your consciousness, and you use it to tackle issues dealing with social sciences, economics, uh, human geography, and that sort of thing, but you're not going to use it to discuss more aesthetic pursuits like uh, conjuring up theories of the good or the beautiful. These are all what a Marxist would call superstructural endeavors rather than substructural. Now, Here's an area where Marxism was of utmost use to society in the latter half of the 20th century and onward. One of the major projects of Marxism in regards to history and the social sciences concerned women. Again, the stated objective of the Marxist perspective when it came to history was to find out how most people live, and how can we talk about most people when we're ignoring 51 or so percent of people by virtue of their genitals. The rise of the Marxist perspective in Western universities was contemporaneous with the rise of second wave feminism in the 1960s. Um, and then feminist theory was introduced into the study of classics and ancient history in 1973. 
Most of our postmodern views on sex and gender and sexual orientation are an outgrowth of the Marxist project to put historically marginalized people back on the map as historical actors. Um, chiefly, these folks are from the lower classes, they're foreigners, they're slaves, they're women, and uh, even the disabled. Most of these people throughout history were treated as, quote, less than fully human, as Bob Garland puts it. Now, patriarchy had always been the primary mode of social power in agricultural societies, and this reign had not been an entirely kind one to the majority of people. The classical cultures we've been discussing were all deeply sexist, and we can prove this in all sorts of ways, and one of these ways is through archaeological remains. We find, especially in classical Greece and China, that rates of female infanticide, generally through exposure, far, far outweighed those of male infanticide. Um, dowries are expensive. I think the statistic stands at something like 25% for female babies being put to death at birth in classical Greece. It's actually around the time of the 7th and 6th centuries BC that the position of Greek women in terms of civil rights really declined rapidly when previously assumed inequalities started being actually ratified by law. Women were stuffed in their bedrooms. They were kept away from the public eye, they were traded like chattel, and they were forced to work the loom. Uh, an interesting fact that I can mention here is that although Greece and Rome had a small handful of female poets that came down to us, there were no female prose writers from these cultures. None whatsoever. Uh, Hindu patriarchy was just as firmly entrenched in this period. We can even see this expressed by the religious belief that a woman, if she did a great job at her womanly duties, would have to come back to this earth as a man before moving on to a higher plane of existence. Gender inequality was intrinsic to the very cosmology of most societies. Women were thought of as both physically and mentally inferior to men, uh, and we can see this at work in definitions of women by Aristotle, which claimed that they were nothing more than, quote, infertile males on account of what he calls their adunamia. Um, this is their lack of power to produce sperm. Men in many parts of the world believe for quite some time that the fullness of human life force, or let's say the form of man itself, was carried entirely in the seed of man, and women merely acted as an incubator or receptacle. We can find Roman law codes frequently using terms like infirmitas sexus, the weakness of their sex, and the levitas animi, the frailty of their mental constitution. Women in most classical civilizations weren't offered any outlets for their talents outside of the usual domestic array of tasks. Women were expected to be socially invisible, attracting as little attention from the public as possible. And this was on account of concepts like pudicitia or integritas. Uh, the more you kept your distance from men that weren't your husband, the more honor you did to him and yourself. Women too much in the public eye were thought of as having dubious sexual morals, uh, regardless of what sort of projects they were involved in. Though, uh, I must admit, this was much more a reality among Greek women than it was among Roman or Indian women. So, I don't think any scholars would defend these civilizations on the charge of sexism, which, let's not forget, is a modern word and concept, but we need to remember before judging the past too harshly 
that women weren't allowed to vote in the United States until the 19th Amendment was passed in the 1920s. And even then, they wouldn't even see the end of the legal subordination of a wife to her husband until 1981, which is a whopping seven years before I was born, to put things into perspective. Now, why did women put up with this for so long? Well, that's a really tough question, and I don't believe there's a single answer, but I think it primarily has to do with education or lack thereof. Women were told from birth by their families, by their culture, by their religions, that they were inferior. They internalized this inferiority complex, and since they were rarely, if ever, educated, they had no reason to believe otherwise. It was like a Stockholm Syndrome they passed down to their children. It wasn't until women began demanding the right to be granted access to education that we could have something like a sexual revolution in the 1960s. It was a deliberate lack of education which has kept women enslaved for so long. Education is key here. Education comes from the Latin educere, which literally means to lead out. Well, to lead out of what? Well, it's obvious. Ignorance. And thus, bondage. If you don't know what you're worth, if you don't know about your intrinsic freedom, then you'll let people do all sorts of terrible things to you. Knowledge and freedom are directly correlated to one another, and likewise are ignorance and slavery. This is why an education, uh, an education in critical thinking, in grammar, in logic, in rhetoric, at the very least, not in rote memorization, is vital to our freedom regardless of where we are from. If you want to know which kinds of slaves wound up being manumitted throughout history, it was the ones who learned to read and write, who were given the time of day to grow as individuals, to find some self-respect, and then to take matters into their own hands. If you haven't noticed, it's not like people are handing out rights. They need to be deduced, or induced, depending on who you talk to, through reason and logic, and then put into manifestation by force of will and force of arm. Women bore mind-forged manacles for millennia because the only thing they were educated in was self-hatred and servitude. And let me tell you something, folks. Freedom comes from love, from the love of self, and from the love of others. If we love ourselves, we will not just give away our rights, which are only ours in so far as we fight for them. And if we love others, we will ensure no one else will be subject to slavery or have their rights violated, especially not by our own hands. As one suffers, all suffer. If we allow for one of us to be enslaved, then we are tacitly agreeing that we can all justifiably be made slaves. I think Alistair Crowley said it best when he wrote of women, and I'm going to give a, a fairly extensive quote. We of Thelema say that every man and woman is a star. We do not fool and flatter women. We do not despise and abuse them. To us, a woman is herself, absolute, original, independent, free, self-justified, exactly as a man is. We dare not thwart her going, goddess she.
we arrogate no right upon her will. We claim not to deflect her development, to dispose of her desires, or to determine her destiny. She is her own sole arbiter. We ask no more than to supply our strengths to her, whose natural weakness else were prey to the world's pressure. Nay more, it were too zealous even to guard her in her going, for she were best by her own self-reliance to win her way forth. We do not want her as a slave. We want her free and royal, whether her love fight death in our arms by night or her loyalty ride by day beside us in the charge of the battle of life. So, to me, this is the healthiest attitude that we can have toward one another as humans, whether man or woman. And this is the way that we can end slavery on an individual level. It has to do with a modality of consciousness which is part platonic justice, part Christ's golden rule. Uh, sometimes I hear this referred to as the platinum rule, or do unto others what they would have you do unto them. It's like the golden rule, plus critical thinking. It's really sad to see, however, how few people throughout history have ultimately reached this elevated level of consciousness, but that's just reality. That's what's undergone the formality of actually occurring, and that's what's been responsible for the hell most people have suffered throughout history, and will continue to suffer as we're all born and reborn back into it. To enslave another is fundamentally to conform their will to your own by threat of force or abandonment. And this is exactly what Crowley wanted to bring an end to in one fell swoop when he said, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. This is the law of the new eon, as he called it. The law of a less barbarous age than the current age we live in, which some have called the Kali Yuga, which signifies a time when ignorance, slavery, and war run amok as a result of our hardened hearts and our aggregate lack of compassion for one another. Crowley was one of the most passionate anti-slavery writers in history. Uh, he absolutely despised the concept of enslavement, but he's also famous for this bold iteration, slaves shall serve. By this, he meant that slavery is a condition or a state of mind that we accept within ourselves first and then it becomes us. When he spoke out against slavery, he spoke out against the mind-forged manacles, not against the enslavers themselves, since they are, after all, just fulfilling their will to power, like an oak in a wood which blots out the sun of all the plants beneath it by virtue of its size. So, with that said, find what good, noble, and beautiful thing you do best, and do it with great focus and attention for the good of all. And likewise, while you're pursuing this great work with zeal and determination, you mustn't detract others from doing what they do best for the good of all. True love is part doing good for the world, part minding your own business. If you've got one without the other, something is wrong. You're either not loving under will or not treating love as the law. In theory, this is nothing radical. 
in practice, this is extremely radical. If we want to save this planet from becoming a hell world, we need to put the solution into practice. We must recognize the divinity and dignity in every man and woman. We must stress a non-dogmatic universal education. We must love our neighbors and we must mind our own business. This is the simplest solution in most adequately dealing with the problems inherent to the phenomenon of social inequality. One really has to wonder to what heights many of these classical civilizations could have achieved if they'd actually fully employed all members of society in a humane manner according to their strengths and weaknesses rather than stuffing them away. What we want then, for the present, is freedom. Freedom from ignorance. Freedom from illusion. And once that's come to every individual, no other form of bondage can be put upon us. This is what Christ meant when he said, the truth shall set you free, because truth is freedom. The sublime goal of moksha or liberation is all about this. It's about achieving a sense of connectedness in the unity of being, moving as individuals among other individuals with the implicit understanding that we are part of one another. You might argue with me that this is all ideological sloganeering, but I think if Plato has taught us anything, it's that ideals need not be realizable to be valid. Don't make the good the enemy of the perfect. Just try it.